like to thank you all for coming and um, thank also the people in the hall for coming. I'm sorry there wasn't room for everyone, though I'm pleased there's so much interest. Um, I have to make a little correction to begin with. My master's was from the University of Quebec at Montreal, and UCAM, uh, the kind of freedom of scholarship allowed there, was very important. Um, there is a difference between UCAM and the University of Montreal. Um, I guess I should get right into the topic. I, I've got to present a book that includes um, a lot of complicated and maybe somewhat um, startling ideas for some people. Um, because it, uh, what I found in the course of my research was that people have forgotten a lot about what the traditional British Constitution was. However, in the course of my research, um, I was dealing a lot with uh, especially members of the Haudenosaunee um, Confederacy. Uh, we know them better as Iroquois. And they've been dealing with the people that made, ended up making Canada and the United States for centuries. And they've had to go through many changes in the political order that um, we live under or that our ancestors lived under, or the ancestors the people who established Canada lived under. The, the title of the book is Ghost Dancing with Colonialism. And uh, the ghost dance began um, among indigenous peoples in the United States who were having uh, difficulty dealing with their colonization. And um, it was a kind of spiritual uh, spiritual response um, uh, where they were just trying to deal with what happened. However, when we understand ghosts from our culture, there's also a sense of being haunted by the past. And um, I think that has more to do with the title. It's, it's the Supreme Court of Canada that is haunted by ghosts of the past that it doesn't really quite understand too well. My research began um, with a study of the application for a membership in the League of Nations that was made by the Haudenosaunee. The representative overseas was Levi General Descahe. Uh, Descahe is a title somewhat like Master of the Rolls in, in British court, or uh, maybe Prime Minister, or. It's just a title. It's, it's the name of an original member of the Confederacy, but um, it wasn't his personal name. It was his physician name. And just to notice in passing, this will be significant as things go on. Uh, you, you can see a copy of the two-row wampum on his knee as he's advocating in Europe. And the two-row wampum is uh, something that represents an important principle in intercultural relations. It's the principle of non-interference in the affairs of um, other countries. Here, uh, this is um, a photograph of an earlier generation of uh, Haudenosaunee uh, Rodianer. Um, they, they call their representatives uh, Rodianer, or Rodianer for one. Um, it, usually is translated into English as chiefs, but their role is not at all like a chief. Um, in our way of thinking in English, a chief is at the top of a hierarchical concept of society, and their model for social order is not hierarchical. Um, I'll have a little bit of that later. I began um, Ghost Dancing with Colonialism, the book, uh, with this quote from Madam Justice LaRue's debate. Um, she, well, if I read it, uh, in light of the evolution of our laws following the passage of the charters, and given the growing recognition that there are many different perspectives, the Aboriginal perspective, for example, I believe that the era of conce uh, concealed underlying premises is now over. In my view, those premises must be brought to the surface in order to promote consistency in our law and the integrity of our judicial system. Now, I doubt if she was aware of it, but in some ways, 
the idea of recognizing different perspectives is very basic to the, the British tradition. And in other ways, it's been forgotten. And as I looked into the issues that were raised by the situation, and I looked at cognitive theory, I began to realize that it is probably impossible for any of us to completely escape our underlying premises. So we need a bit of humility when we uh, approach intercultural problems. Um, uh, this book is an invitation to explore intercultural differences and the problems that arise from them. Um, and it's an invitation to explore unfamiliar intellectual terrain that was referred to in one of the quotes that I used at the beginning of the book. The cases that I used um, to study the reasoning of the judges um, were mostly cases that interpreted Section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982, which says that the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights um, of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada are recognized and affirmed. That's the statement in law that the judges were working with. I don't think that in the end one can really say that there has been an affirmation of Indigenous rights. There hasn't been an understanding of the problems involved in doing that. One of the problems one confronts when, uh, especially if one wants to take a positive view of Canadian law, is that there are a great deal of anomalies when it comes to the application of the law to Indigenous peoples. And there are also anomalies in the perceptions that people have. Stephen Harper made the news conveniently in the middle of my research by announcing that we have no history of colonialism in, China, uh, in Canada. Um, and by this time, I already knew that uh, when Canada was named a Dominion of Canada, uh, the Dominion of Canada, a Dominion was defined as a colony. And a colony was defined as any part of His Majesty's dominions exclusive of the British Islands and British India. Um, in fact, and I think this will be a surprise to most people and most lawyers, uh, the Constitution Act, 1867, which is the current name of the British North America Act, states that Canada's purpose is to promote the interests of the British Empire. The British Empire probably doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it's a bit of sloppiness in the drafting, or it reflects our failure to reflect on how deeply colonized we are. However, if we look back to the beginning of the last century, Canadians were very proud to be a British colony. And we see, for example, Wilfrid Laurier, a former Prime Minister of Canada, stating, we are British subjects. Canada is one of the daughter nations of the empire, and we realize to the full the rights and obligations which are involved in that proud title. So uh, there's been a real, there's been a change in paradigm and a change in people's attitude that you can see if you contrast Stephen Harper's concept of Canada with Wilfrid Laurier's. Uh, Madam Justice McLaughlin, um, she, I'm sure, felt she was speaking for all Canadians when she said that respect for the inherent dignity and equality of human beings, tolerance of difference, and democratic freedoms are part of the social fabric. We certainly want it to be. However, when we take a look at the experience of indigenous peoples, it's hard to support that vision. Um, one of the, um, if we look back in legal history, and we look at the legal treatment of indigenous peoples, um, we can find, for example, that between 1876 and 1951, 
The Indian Act defined a person as an individual other than an Indian. So if you define indigenous people outside of humanity, in, a, in essence, um, then all these generous sayings become true. Um, but it's hardly fair. Um, this kind of thinking uh, seems to have impacted on the interpretations given to the British North America Act. Uh, section 9124 states that Indians and lands belonging to the Indians fall under the exclusive legislative authority of the Parliament of Canada. This has been interpreted as license for the Canadian Parliament to make laws for Indigenous people who, at the time that this was passed, did not have a vote in the Canadian Parliament, and to impose those laws on the Indigenous peoples. Um, I don't think that's necessarily the original intention of the wording of that act that was passed by the British Parliament, because Section 91 deals with foreign affairs. And um, certainly it hasn't been interpreted that just because Canadian Parliament is to deal with uh, aliens and with other states, um, that uh, Canada has a right to make laws for them. Um, a question I had to ask, because by the time I was looking into this, I knew a lot about Haudenosaunee history and how deeply tied these people were to the development of both Canada and the United States. And so I wondered why there wasn't a lot of objection that they didn't participate in the formation of the British North America Act. However, in the late 1800s, um, when Canada started to legislate for Indigenous peoples, um, many um, uh, members of the Six Nations, as we saw in the earlier photographs of the wampum, started reminding people of the two row wampum, or trying to remind them, which stands for the principle, people usually say the two rows. Uh, the rows represent the paths of two ships, the British ship and the indigenous canoe, people say. Um, I have one thing that says that that was a British interpretation of the two row wampum. But they each was to look after their own internal affairs and not to interfere with the other. And in fact, Britain did follow that policy in the early years when people were uh, meeting and when the majority of the population in Eastern Canada was still indigenous. It's only as the population shifted that the interpretation shifted. Somehow, indigenous peoples became invisible in Canada. And I think they're still invisible because people often make general statements about Canada that exclude the experience of indigenous peoples. Um, if we look, there's always been a lag between general principles that Canada has supported and the conduct of officials within the country. For example, Canada was one of the first signatories of the Charter of the United Nations, which begins with a very strong statement about human equality. Um, the Charter of the United Nations came into effect in 1945. However, the Indian Act did not delete the exclusion of indigenous uh, peoples as persons until 1951. Canada was an enthusiastic signatory of the Genocide Convention in 1951. And the Genocide Convention says quite clearly that genocide includes taking children from their parents or from their nation and having them raised by members of another uh, cultural group. And residential uh, schools continued merrily along for a couple of decades and then there was a 60s scoop. Uh, we did get the residential school apology in 2008, but despite some of the amendments um, that have been made, I don't think there's a full comprehension of the depth of the damage that was done.
Um, racially based voting was repealed in 1948, but the right of people defined as Indians to vote without losing their treaty rights um, was not instated until 1960. Um, at the United Nations, Canada supported the um, decolonization resolutions. However, um, that, that was in 1961. Um, however, Canada did not include any indigenous representation in the constitutional reform that took place in 1982 when the constitution was patriated. Um, to date, as far as I know, except perhaps for some of the more recent treaties, there are, are no indigenous peoples that have been asked whether or not they wanted to join Canada, um, or, and if so, on what terms. There's just been an assumption that all indigenous people are Canadians. Um, the chapter on paradigms and cognitive structure is probably the chapter that I would start with if I was teaching a full course on the contents of this book, or probably of anything else, because the information on how we, ta how we take in information, um, it's important to understanding how indigenous people can have become invisible and remained invisible for so long. Why do they continue to remain invisible when mo I think the majority of Canadians recognize that an injustice was done, or many injustices? Um, one of the problems is that we can't think without a set of paradigms. We can't think or communicate. You wouldn't understand what I was saying if you hadn't learned all the paradigms included in English, all the, all the thoughts that get expressed by the sounds of English. Um, paradigms, uh, linguistic paradigms, differ very radically from one language to the next. There are actually languages that have virtually no adjectives. And apparently, though I don't know any indigenous languages myself, some of them use verbs a lot more than nouns. And there are huge discussions that could be had on the significance of um, high levels of nominalization instead of verbs and so forth. Um, one of the characteristics of paradigms is that we tend to ignore any evidence that doesn't fit our paradigm. So we think of Canada as a just nation, um, therefore we have a lot of difficulty accepting that Canada committed any injustices. Another problem is that an established paradigm will continue in use unless an alternate is available. And so I think that to really affirm indigenous rights, we either have to go back to some of the old paradigms that respected them, or we have to invent a new one. And that has to be done if, if human equality is a primary um, value in our society, that has to be done with the knowledge, consent, and participation, equal participation of indigenous peoples. When I say that we might go back to an earlier paradigm, um, I'm referring it to and thinking of the British monarchical um, constitution. Now, uh, nobody teaches about this in law schools in Canada. I stumbled into it on my own after reading the petitions of the Six Nations um, that they sent to the League of Nations and to the British Crown, um, uh, insisting that they were allies, not subjects of Britain. And eventually something clicked in my head and I said, well, how was a subject legally defined? Um, and I looked in Halsbury's Laws of England and I, uh, it states quite simply that the relationship of subject and monarch was conceived as a personal one involving a bargain under which the monarch gave the subject protection and undertook to govern according to the laws of the land and the subject owed the monarch legally enforceable allegiance. This pattern of relationship um, evolved from feudal, feudalism. Under feudalism, a subject um, had to swear an oath of allegiance to their lord
uh, that they would obey the Lord's command in everything but treason, theft, or murder. To balance that, however, we have the coronation oath. And in England, you cannot become a legal monarch unless you swear an oath to God that you will govern the people according to their respective laws and customs. Uh, it's important to the British Constitution. That's why they make such a big ceremony out of the coronation. But it seems that even though people watch the ceremony, they don't understand what it means. And the effect of this oath is to say that the monarch is also subject to the law, and that the law the monarch is subject to um, is made by the people. It brings populist control down to the level of the people. So um, this is a, a kind of um, uh, diagram of how that constitution worked. Um, the law might be made by different peoples. Um, initially, there was the law of Essex, the law of Mercia, the Dane law. There were different kinds of law in different parts of England. Uh, London had its own laws. The monarch was to obey and protect those laws. Um, uh, in the Magna Carta, Wales had the right to have its laws protected and recognized. After Quebec was conquered, the people of Quebec had a right to have their laws recognized and protected. Canada, South Africa, India, all these places had their laws recognized and the British believe they were protecting them. I don't know. Um, when you look at that format, one has to wonder why there was an equal protection granted to indigenous laws. There was at first in the East. Um, there, were, uh, there was an earlier time when some of the laws of the people there were protected. And some of the indigenous peoples in the area, now claimed by Canada, had very well-defined legal systems. There, was, um, there are books that have been published for years. There's one here on the Constitution of the Five Nations or the Iroquois Book of the Great Law. They're sometimes called the Six Nations because um, another group joined them. There's one that's been recently published by UBC Press uh, by Richard Atlio, who's the father of uh, Sean Atlio, the current uh, head of the um, AFN. And uh, this is actually very interesting because it provides a philosophy of accommodation that could work. Um, because I think one of the reasons why people resist um, recognizing indigenous rights is that a strict in interpretation and application of uh, British law or Canadian law, uh, property law, would mean that there was no place for the majority of the Canadian population to go. Um, and um, Richard Atlio's philosophy um, would recognize that members of the immigrant society are also part of nature and have to be accommodated and that um, the colonization, which has been so horrible, is um, all the same a challenge that he feels that indigenous people are capable of meeting. So if we followed strictly British law, indigenous laws should have been accommodated. However, there is a problem in British tradition. And as I looked at the tradition, I realized that there are two concepts of law that intertwine in British tradition. One of them is based on command and the use of force. We have William the Conqueror. And surprisingly, a lot of British people recognize very quickly, without um, in any context, that William the Conqueror was a colonizer and that the people that were indigenous to Britain were colonized by William the Conqueror. So what happened when people came over here was a deep culture, a deeply entrenched cultural pattern. However, there's also a deep tradition in Britain of um, a law that's based on the consent of the people. It's reflected in the Magna Carta, 
It's reflected in the coronation oath, and it's in, reflected in many of the struggles that the population of Britain had through their history. So this is why I thought um, the painting by John Fadden that appears on the cover of the book was appropriate because um, there is this conflict between the two models of legality. Um, usually, um, the painting shows flint and sapling. Um, the ideas they represent are similar to the ideas of yin and yang in the I Ching. Um, European people tend to interpret them as good and evil, but I think flint and sapling represents the idea better. There's a time when pliability is advantageous and a time when strict um, hardness is advantageous. There should have been a strict, hard protection given to indigenous rights, and there wasn't. But at times, it's difficult to tell one model of law from the other. And I think when one starts looking at and analyzing Supreme Court of Canada judgments, we can see that there is a confusion in the judges' minds. The judges would like to support an egalitarian, uh, democratic society. They'd like to see Canada as a free and democratic society. But when it comes right down to it, um, they don't seem to be able to see a way to extend those rights fully to indigenous peoples. When we consider those two models of law, one based on command and the use of force, that certainly supports colonialism, and the other based on populist consent, um, we find that in international law, colonialism was rejected formally at the League of Nations. Um, at that time, uh, President Wilson of the United States, who was a great inspiration to the League of Nations, stated that conquest and aggrandizement were gone. Oh,